ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಐ ಬಾವ್ ದ ಲೋಟಸ್ ಫೀಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೈ ಗುರು ಪರಮಹಂಸ ಯೋಗನಾಂದ ಐ ಬಾವ್ ಟು ಹಿಸ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಲೀನೇಜ್ ಆಫ್ ಟೀಚರ್ಸ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ಮಹಾವತಾರ್ ಬಾಬಾಜಿ ಲಹರಿ ಮಹಾಶಾಯ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಶ್ರೀಯುಕ್ತೇಶ್ವರ್ ಗಿರಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಬಾವ್ ಟು ದೇರ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಡಿಸೈಪಲ್ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಕ್ರಿಯಾನಂದ so friends welcome to the fourth episode in the series on the mahabharata i hope you have been enjoying the first three uh, before i jump right into the story we will start with a brief recap we saw the story of king shantanu who represents the spirit beyond creation shantanu falls in love with ganga who is the cosmic vibration and through her he has eight children seven of them are drowned in the river by ganga and they do not survive the eighth child is bhishma and he represents ego consciousness and then shantanu falls in love with satyavati who represents the physical universe primordial uh, nature as matter and uh, all the satyavati is interested in marrying him her father has some conditions he wants bhishma to relinquish the kingdom or his uh, right over the throne so that satyavati's children become the heirs for the kingdom of hastinapura so bhishma takes some drastic vows in order to appease satyavati's father he takes three vows the first one is that he will relinquish any claim he has over the throne of hastinapura the second one is a vow of lifelong celibacy that he will not take on a partner or have any children that would eventually claim right to the throne and the third vow in order to appease the elders of the kingdom he decides that he will always stand by the throne and the king of hastinapura and protect the kingdom in his name so these are the vows that he takes So that's where we left the story. Now moving right ahead. So as we all know Satyavati ends up marrying Shantanu and they have two sons, Chitrangada and Vichitravirya. Chitrangada does not live very long. He dies a very premature death. Vichitravirya grows up to be a young man and by default he is now the heir for the throne of Hastinapura because Bhishma obviously has relinquished any claim over the kingdom. So everybody is looking for Vichitravirya to be the next king. Now Bhishma since Vichitravirya is a young man, he wants him to marry and have a queen. So he goes to a swayamvara that is being held by the king of Kashi, who's Kashi Raja. Now a swayamvara is an Indian tradition for those of you who are not familiar. It's a tradition where um a princess or a lady of a royal family is being given in marriage and invitation is sent to princes and uh, kings of various kingdom ac- kingdoms across the country and they all show up and the the lady gets to pick who her man is and in order to do that uh, there is some kind of a competition where there is a display of strength or some kind of powers that the the men have to uh, go through in order to win the hand of the lady so that's what a swayamvara is so kashi raja is holding a swayamvara for three of his daughters they are amba ambika and ambalika bhishma shows up at the swayamvara obviously we all know bhishma has taken a vow of lifelong celibacy so he's not looking for a partner for himself but he is looking to find a girl for his brother vichitravirya that's why he said the swayamvara and as we all know there's nobody in the heaven or earth who can actually fight bhishma so he wins all the conquests um that is the competition and he wins the hands of all the three women and he takes them back to hastinapura so that they can be married to vichitravirya polygamy being um, common in those times that's why he takes all the three women now there is an issue though when they reach hastinapura amba the very first daughter of kashi raja discloses that she has been in love with the king of salva and he also showed up at the swayamvara and she was hoping that he would win and they will get to marry however bhishma had this long fight with salva and he won that is bhishma won so salva was defeated and bhishma won amba and took her back to hastinapura so her hopes for marrying the love of her life uh, could not come to fruition now bhishma being a noble man himself he tells amba you know there are two other sisters that you have who can marry vichitravirya so i give you full permission to go back to salva and uh, ask him to marry you and uh, i wish you well and amba goes to salva and she proposes marriage because that's who she wanted to marry however 
Saul was not impressed because his pride was already hurt because he got defeated by Bhishma in the competition and now Amba coming back to him almost seems like a charity from Bhishma that he's accepting something that Bhishma doesn't want anymore. So, you know, he cannot go with it. So he says, Amba, he says to Amba, I cannot marry you. You have to go to Hastinapura because, you know, Bhishma won you and he took you there. You can, you cannot be my wife anymore. And Amba, she's not happy about it, but she goes back to Hastinapura and tells Bhishma that she has to now marry into this family because Salva wouldn't accept her anymore. Bhishma, in his right conscience, he's not able to marry Amba to Vichitravirya because she was already committed, or rather, uh, she was already in love with a different man, so he doesn't want her to marry Vichitravirya. And Amba is sort of stuck without any options. She cannot go back to her father, she cannot go to Salva, and she cannot be in Hastinapura either. She tells Bhishma, the only option I have left is for you to marry me. Because if you don't marry me, I don't have any other option left. And uh, she's pretty infuriated and uh, there are other things that happen. But at the end of the story, I'll cut it short. And basically Bhishma refuses and he stands by his vow with all his willpower and says he will not marry Amba. And Amba does not take it well. She was so angry she wouldn't mind even killing Bhishma. That's the power of her anger. However, Bhishma, according to the rules of warfare, he cannot fight a woman. So they cannot battle each other and Amba cannot actually attack him. So she is incapacitated and she cannot kill him. But all her anger is boiling inside her. Um, and with, with those unresolved feelings, she decides she's just going to kill herself but not just disappear from the scene, she takes a vow before she dies. She says she's going to reincarnate and the next time she comes around, she's going to reincarnate as a man so that he can, he can come to Bhishma at a low point in Bhishma's life and take from him everything that is left, including his life. So that is what Amba decides and she jumps into the fire and kills herself. So, we are going to come back and revisit Amba's next incarnation during the war of Mahabharata. We will come to that later. And uh, Ambika and Ambalika end up uh, marrying Vichitravirya. However, again, Vichitravirya does not have a very long life either. He also dies a premature death and uh, he does not have any offsprings. So now Hastinapura is left in a very weird situation. There is no king, there is Bhishma who cannot become the king and there are two queens, uh, Ambika and Ambalika, and they don't have sons of their own. So the throne is completely unclaimed and there's nobody to rule the land. And now Satyavati steps in. She proposes an option. She proposes the practice of Niyoga. It is an ancient tradition or practice where uh, a man and woman unite, not out of marriage or not for pleasure or not for any other reason, but simply to have an offspring in order to sustain the lineage. That is the practice of Niyoga. And she says this situation warrants that tradition because there is no heir to the throne and we need an offspring in order to rule this country. And she calls upon her son Vyasa. And we briefly discussed the story of Vyasa earlier. Vyasa is one of Satyavati's sons, but before she met Shantanu. This happened to her when she was very young, and Vyasa was born to her through the sage Parashara. So again, long story short, Vyasa resists uh, um, initially, but then he agrees because it's a noble and valid cause. So he says, okay, I will um, unite with the two of your brides, and I will give them sons so that you will have an offspring for the throne. So that way, Vyasa approaches Ambika. Now, Vyasa is described as an older man and he's very dark in complexion and he has a long white beard. So certainly not the picture of the Prince Charming that Ambika and Ambalika had in their minds when they married into Hastinapura. So they're not too impressed about, you know, uniting with Vyasa. So he first approaches Ambika and Ambika cringes and she closes her eyes because she cannot look at him because of which she begets a son and that son is born blind. And Ambika's son is Dhritarashtra. We already briefly discussed with Dhritarashtra in the very first episode. And he now approaches the second bride, Ambalika. And Ambalika is also not happy. She turns pale. 
just out of uh, repulsion uh, to Vyasa, because of which she gets a son who is also born Peo. And her son is Pandu, who becomes the father of the Pandavas. And the third time Vyasa comes, neither Amba, Ambika or Ambalika are up for it. They send their maid in their place so that they don't have to face Vyasa. And the maid is not as repulsed as Ambika or Ambalika is. So she receives Vyasa more open-heartedly and she has a son through him. And her son is born completely able and capable and his name is Vidura. However, Vidura is, although uh, he's born almost as a stepbrother to Dhritarashtra and Pandu, since he's born to the maid, he is considered lower in caste. He sort of he grows up with his stepbrothers, but he's not necessarily considered of royal lineage. So we will discuss more about Vidura also in the future episodes. So that's where the story is. I think I'll pause here and discuss some of the symbolism of the things we discussed, and we will begin the story from where we left in this episode in the next one. So going back, uh, we already know what Shantanu, Ganga, Satyavati, all of them represent. We are still talking about very subtle psychological aspects. We have not come to the, the more prevalent attitudes and things that we face in our mind. Now Chitrangada, who is the first son of Satyavati and Shantanu, who represent pure spirit, Purusha, the masculine principle, and primordial nature as the physical universe. Their first son, Chitrangada, he represents Chitta. Chitta is the primordial feeling nature, it's soul consciousness in its absolute essence. That's what Chitta is. And that's what Chitrangada represents. And that is the essential nature of the soul. However, he does not have a long life at all because that primordial feeling nature is immediately overcome by the sense of individuality, of that self-expression, which is what Vichitravirya represents. Yogananda called Vichitravirya divine ego. He said he's a symbol for divine ego. Again, all this is fairly metaphysical, so I'm not going to go very deep into all of this. We will spend more time on practical spirituality that applies in our lives. I just want to say, Vichitravirya is still different from Bhishma, who represents ego consciousness. Ego consciousness is that sense of identity with uh, the body, mind, and um, the intellect as oneself, and the sense of separation from everything else. That's what ego consciousness is. Whereas um, Vichitravirya is simply the sense of I. It's simply the, the self-expression of individuality as its own self. It is not the delusion of separateness. So it, it's all fairly subtle, but I'll just leave it at that. And the two daughters that Vichitravirya ends up marrying, Ambika and Ambalika, they represent the two poles of the mind, the negative doubt and positive discrimination or positive doubt. That's what they represent. And from the negative doubt, is born Dhritarashtra. And Dhritarashtra represents the sensory mind. He represents the mind that is blind because it does not have any perception of its own. It is simply feeding off of the senses. That's what Dhritarashtra is. And we will see more about him. And that's why he's, he's born blind. And through Ambalika, the positive discriminating faculty is born Pandu. Pandu represents buddhi or intellect. Um, again, the English words are not as subtle as the Sanskrit terms I'm using, so these are the most approximate words one can find in order to describe the concepts that the Mahabharata is talking about. Vyasa represents uh, what in Sanskrit is called Viveka, or the discriminating faculty. He represents the concept of relativity, of differentiation and discrimination. What Pandu represents is our own intellect. The intellect is that sense of objectivity, of understanding the world around us, again through discrimination, but it is the individual's own faculty to apply that in rational thinking. That's what Pandu represents, which is buddhi. And Vidura, who is born of the lower caste, he represents dharma, or the righteous consciousness. So he's completely able-bodied. He's not uh, like Pandu or Dhritarashtra. Dhritarashtra is blind. Pandu is pale because he's, he's, he's not as strong because he can immediately be overcome by Dhritarashtra who, who has a more stronger personality but who's blind. 
And Vidrashtra is always accompanied by Vidura because Dharma is always counseling the mind. And sometimes he listens, sometimes he doesn't. But Dharma is always by his side. So that's what these characters represent. And uh, there's perhaps one other thing I'll say before finishing this episode, which is something that I find interesting and a, a rather subtle uh, symbolism that is embedded within the Mahabharata. I want to go back to something I mentioned in the previous episode about Bhishma, where I'm, I spoke about how Bhishma taking the vows is in a way the beginning of the Mahabharata. It is the first seed for the war of Mahabharata. And the reason I said that is, is because when a man and woman unite, they have offsprings. And in, in the tradition of Sanatan Dharma, they continue to live through those offsprings. And that is how the lineage represents the lineage of karma through which families continue. And that is why it is important for us to work on our own self-realization because by liberating that karma that is holding us back, we are not only just doing something selfish, but we are working for the greater good of everybody connected with us. Now, again, in the Vedic tradition, that that karma or the lineage propagates through the sperm, through the male principle. And that's what is called gotra in the Sanskrit language. And the Indians who are watching this video perhaps understand what I'm talking about. Now, the interesting thing to note here is all the characters that are about to come, the Pandavas and the Kauravas, who are the sons of Pandu and Dhritarashtra, they all belong to the Kuru clan. They are all descendants of Shantanu. However, until Shantanu and Bhishma, the lineage came directly through Kuru and his ancestors. Now, because Bhishma took the vow, and because of everything else that happened after that, Vichitravirya does not have offsprings of his own. And although he has wives, and although uh, in, in, in theory he has sons who can take on the throne and uh, rule the kingdom, in actuality they are not born through uh, the sperm that is coming through this particular lineage. They are born through Vyasa, who is the son of Parashara and who is the grandson of Vashishta. And Vashishta is perhaps the most revered of Vedic rishis, and he is not just a great soul, he's a fully liberated master. And everybody that comes in this lineage now are coming through that subtle um, karma that is being introduced by Vyasa. And all of this happens only because Bhishma takes that vow. Because you will see that all these factors somehow play into each other and it's all going to end up in this big battle that everybody is trying to avoid but it's completely inevitable. What I'm trying to say through all of this is, all this happens because Bhima takes the vow, sorry, Bhishma takes the vow. And he takes the vow. What it represents is the ego saying, I'm still identified with my delusion. I'm still identified as being separate and I think I am this body and mind. However, I'm going to take this vow to live a life that is not purely for self-gratification. I've come to a point where I understand that life is more than self-gratification, so I'm going to work for a higher good, but I'm still stuck in the delusion because that's who I am. And that's the vow that Bhishma is taking in, in terms of what it practically means to us. And because of that vow, everything shifts. Now, Shantanu's own lineage, the Kuru clan, is theoretically following that same family line and propagating in, in in the way that it's meant to. However, they are not directly coming through the Kuru lineage or through Shantanu, but they're all coming through the lineage of uh, Vashishta, who represents, you know, the Supreme Guru and a liberated soul. And now all these characters that are born, they are going to end up in the war. And the ultimate result of all this, the ultimate result of Bhishma's vow is the soul's liberation. And that's what the Battle of Mahabharata is. How we get there, what happens after this, we will look at all of it in the next episode. God bless you.